and do what's called joint medical doctrine. Um, in terms of, I've been in the military 22 years, just introducing the other, but I've been in the military 22 years. I started off as a uh, combat medical technician, um, and I'm now a medical support officer, which is like a healthcare manager, if you will. Um, in terms of my academic sort of background, um, it's in healthcare management and also defence as well, um, academically, operationally. Um, I've done several operational tours, probably most recently, the most relevant two tour tours of Afghanistan and one tour of Iraq as well. Um, my next job when I finish in the Development Concepts and Doctrine Centre is to go out to Germany and to command an armoured medical regiment and bring that regiment back to the UK. So that just gives you a, a little insight to uh, me. Um, in terms of the Development Concepts and Doctrine Centre, we're situated down in Stripenham, and we're a small group of about 35, but the team acts as a, a think tank, basically, for the Ministry of Defence. Uh, it's broken down into three parts. We have a concepts team that basically does looks forward to the future and does some crystal ball gazing in terms of global strategic trends. Um, we have my team, or the team that I work in, which is Doctrine, um, which um, looks at uh, capturing lessons from operations and turning those lessons into uh, written guidance so future military commanders and staff officers can take that and actually apply it to, to, to future conflicts. We also have a, an, anal an, a, an analysis and a research team to support the work that the concepts and doctrine um, people do. And we provide um, the Ministry of Defence and the Vice Chief of the Defence Staff with um, um, thinking and strategic thought in terms of influencing the decisions that are made at a strategic level within the Ministry of, De uh, Ministry of Defence. Okay, um, today I'm going to talk about Joint Doctrine Notes um, 3 slash 1 4, which is available through the World Wide Web. And I'll give you the, um, I'll give you the email address or the, the, the web address at, at the end. But this is a publication that I actually um, have been involved in developing and was released um, sometime last week. And this publication looks at capturing the lessons predominantly from Afghanistan, but also other conflicts as well, in terms of the military medical contribution to security and, and stabilization operations. Um, as I go through the presentation, there'll be lots of ethical dilemmas and challenges that will probably jump out in your mind. And what I hope to do is um, stop before I'm due to, 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 to finish the presentation and perhaps break out. And if you make a note of those questions, we can come back to those questions at the end and we can have a bit of a debate and a bit of a discussion in terms of the key points. My presentation itself, um, I have got a script. It's the first time I've given the presentation um, on this particular joint doctrine note. So I'll be using a script. Um, and I'm sure the more, I, I'll, I'll, I'll no doubt be rolling this presentation out lots of times in the future. I'll become more than uh, familiar with this, but if you bear with me, as I said, it's the, my first time. Okay, so there are many examples of the UK military medical services being used to alleviate suffering amongst non-combatant populations in the aftermath of the conflict. UK field hospitals operating in Iraq saw Iraqi combat casualties, civilians and children at the accident and emergency department and provided surgery and emergency care. Similarly, the UK field hospitals in Afghanistan care for detainees, indigenous civilian security forces and civilian casualties as well as NATO casualties. Modern conflict involves multiple actors with military forces potentially conducting war fighting and stabilisation operations all in the same um, theatre and in the same operation. Warfare no longer simply consists of two state actors and pitting it out um, to the end. But this presentation will consider how the UK military medical services contribute to establishing security through stabilisation activities on contemporary operations, including some of the tools used to support ethical decision making. My aim is to provide an overview of the high level guidance given to the UK military medical assets when providing emergency care to an indigenous population, performing security sector reform activities and developing the indigenous civilian health sector on operations. When I say security sector reform, I mean the support that the Defence Medical Services provides on operations to develop the indigenous and um, security forces in terms of their um, medical capability. Okay, the scope of the presentation then, we'll start by providing some context by looking at the functions of the armed forces, the UK armed forces, and um, today. 
I'll then move on to review the key medical lessons on security and stabilization from recent operations, predominantly in Afghanistan, before discussing the main points to consider when supporting a typical um, health sector in crisis on operations. I will then consider how emergency care is provided to an indigenous population by the military, including the provision of support to indigenous security forces, before concluding by highlighting how healthcare is developed within civilian indigenous population by military medical assets. Okay. A government's primary role is to ensure the survival of the state. A government must also seek to increase, increase the state's prosperity and thereby strengthen its stability. The military has a role to play, not just as the guarantor of the nation's security against threat, but also in, in supporting wider interests in stability and prosperity. To achieve this, our government requires our armed forces to be capable of fulfilling three overarching functions. Defence of the homeland, forward engagement, and projecting military power. Each one encompasses a broad range of tasks in which the military must either play a leading or a supporting role within a whole government effort. This slide illustrates that model. The key areas that are relevant to overseas security and stabilisation are forward engagement and support of our government objectives and projecting military power in order to support our national interests. Forward engagement includes acting early to prevent conflict and tackling the root causes of instability, including helping to build partner capacity and contributing to peacekeeping operations. One of the key tasks when projecting military power is the ability to resolve, con to resolve conflicts and contribute to stability as part of an alliance or independently if it's in our national interests. Both forward engagement and the projection of military power requires the military medical services to be capable of the security and stabilisation tasks that will be outlined in this presentation. Okay. A lot of work is currently being conducted within the military community to identify the key lessons from over a decade of conflict in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Two key lessons that have been identified are the requirement for the military medical services to prepare military personnel to mentor indigenous healthcare systems and also the need to prepare to treat the entire population suite that's likely to present on operations. UK involvement in the development of the indigenous military and civilian healthcare systems in Afghanistan has been an important activity, as was the clinical capability for the military to treat a patient suite that went beyond the military audience and included groups such as paediatrics and geriatrics. Maintaining the capability in these areas is critical and many of the concepts described in this presentation will ensure that these key lessons are captured for future operations. Okay, moving on to look at typical health sector in crisis. The absence of security in a country does not just affect national military defence. Article 25 of the United Nations Charter of Human Rights asserts that being healthy and having ac access to healthcare are essential elements of human security. This underpins the UN's responsibility to protect agenda that emphasises preventative and developmental uh, interventions, as well as using military force to support populations within countries in crisis. Conflict has a direct impact on, pop on population health. As individuals become injured because of fighting, it also has a significant imp uh, indirect impact through population displacements, damage to health institutions, and collapse of the economic activities needed to fund health programmes. Access to health services is therefore an essential component in restoring stable governance. Medical support to military operations is tailored to the military population at risk and guided by the assess risks to UK um, troops. However, it will be always be necessary to provide support to captured personnel and often to friendly indigenous military forces. Supporting our military force must remain paramount, together with providing emergency care for all casualties as it's urgently needed. The military must adhere to the UN guidelines in the top of this slide when involved in the medical aspects of governance, reconstruction and development. In addition, although the military is not considered a humanitarian agency, there may be occasions during combat or even military operations where we are required to respond and provide humanitarian assistance to both the humanitarian crisis and support stabilisation operation. In such cases, 
NATO states that the three principles at the bottom of this slide must be respected. It's essential that the military develops an understanding of the responsibilities and the relationships that influence indigenous health sectors as an holistic concept at the national level. This diagram illustrates these relationships. The precise uh, balance of power will vary um, and will almost certainly be different to Western socialized health systems. I do not plan to describe this slide in detail. However, an understanding of the relationships in this model from a military perspective is an essential starting point when supporting the development of an indigenous health sector. And we can come back to this um, later in questions, if you like. It's important for the military to be capable of assessing the indigenous health needs and identify and consider the likely tasks for the military medical services. This should cover the, health, the context of the health sector, statistics on the health of the population, information on current health services, and a description of the stakeholders in the health sector. Ideally, this should be conducted by indigenous health professionals with technical assistance from civilian agencies. However, if the military medical services are asked to assist, we should be prepared to help. Casualties from conflict must be treated in priority solely based on clinical need. The military medical plan will define these patient groups who are eligible for access to the international military medical system, including the international system comprises of international military system comprises of initial medical evacuation, entry to an allied military hospital, and in theatre transfer to an allied or indigenous hospital and strategic medical evacuation. The population at risk is likely to include all international forces international civilians supporting military forces and opposing forces <coughs> detained by the international force. It's likely that international forces will be eligible for access to all aspects of an allied medical military system, which may include strategic air and medical evacuation. In stabilization or counterinsurgency operations, eligibility may be extended to indigenous security forces and the civilian population. Armed conflict causing indigenous casualties may occur at a time when indigenous medical facilities are underdeveloped and under pressure. This may restrict or prevent access to indigenous healthcare services. In such circumstances, it's unlikely that the international military medical system can cover all of these deficiencies. This may cause moral or ethical challenges for allied military medical personnel. Indigenous patients should receive care from indigenous healthcare workers unless they are override, there are overriding reasons why the international military medical system should provide this care. Casualties amongst local civilians and security forces may be given access to medical evacuation care in the international military medical system, but this will become increasingly constrained the further along the evacuation chain they actually move. Our military medical system includes a management process that controls entry and can be adjusted according to capacity, and this is known as the medical rules of eligibility. Generally, all personnel, all personal care for patients in indigenous civilian hospitals is likely to be provided by family members, and much of the inpatient medical care has to be paid for, even in the free and public hospital system. Once inside the military medical system, Controlling medical evacuation is influenced by the need to provide increasing levels of care and the complexity of the family support to the patient. This issue is summarised as gatekeeping access shown in this slide. And again, I'm not going to talk about this in detail because it takes too much time, but we, we, can, turn, we can return to this diagram uh, after, uh, in questions, or alternatively, you can have a look it up in the joint doctrine note online, and there's more supporting information there. The medical rules of eligibility process defines patient groups by their level of access to the international military medical system. International forces usually have the right to access to the, the, to the whole of the system. Indigenous security forces may have the right to access for emergency medical care, including life, limb and eyesight saving care. Care for indigenous civilians may follow the same principles, could, but could be further limited to injury caused by conflict reducing access for normal medical and surgical emergencies. Describing and applying these rules 
have to be carefully balanced to make sure that the international military medical system follows the humanitarian principles highlighted earlier and supports consent building without undermining the development of the indigenous health economy. This slide provides an example of how the medical rules of eligibility for a medical evacuation request during a military operation. It is colour coded so the eligibility rules can be adjusted for access by indigenous patients dependent on the um, unoccupied capacity in the medical system. Medical rules of eligibility green describes the normal situation in which civilians may be admitted for emergency medical care to receive life, limb and eyesight saving treatment. Medical rules of eligibility amber excludes those indigenous civilians with life, limb and eyesight conditions that are not conflict related unless by prior agreement with the formation medical director and the hospital commander. And finally, medical rules of eligibility red is imposed when our hospital system is full and therefore no indigenous civilians can be accepted unless injured as a direct result of international military actions. Local security force casualties and captured persons would still be eligible for emergency care under medical rules of eligibility red. Security is the bedrock of stability. And from the outset of operations, military forces can, should consider helping to develop indigenous security forces within the, within the medium term plan to achieve stability. Health service support is a key moral and physical component of fighting power and is one of the essential capabilities that enables the indigenous security forces to become self-sufficient. Let's have a look at some of the strategic, operational and tactical level issues involved in providing support to an indigenous security force. The strategic level of operations that facilitates military medical engagement and security sector reform has two dimensions, out of country and in country. The out of country dimension concerns integrating national integrated approaches across the international community to achieve coherence in the theatre of operations. Um, in terms of um, the in-theatre plan, the in-theatre strategic plan needs to be um, coordinated not just with the international military community, but it needs to be led by the indigenous government, if there is an indigenous government, and coordinated also with international organisations and non-governmental organisations. Um, when going into a theatre, we need to determine eligibility for access to, to healthcare early. So I talked about medical rules of eligibility, who is actually eligible for healthcare within the theatre of operations? Are we going to be treating indigenous security forces, allies, civilians? How is it going to work? We clearly need to do an estimate on who is, there, who is eligible. In addition, comp competition for human resources and funding may limit development. So when we get into a theatre of operations, how is the development of either the indigenous and health sector or the health sector within the indigenous security forces actually being funded? And are people actually available in terms of health sector workers within the country that you're operating in to actually be employed within those areas? Because what we often find in places like Afghanistan, it's more lucrative to be employed as an interpreter than it is for, for, the, uh, for the alliance than it is to actually practice healthcare in an in, in, in indigenous uh, medical hospital. So we can get back on track. In terms of operational level issues then, um, developing the indigenous field medical system, there are two aspects of the indigenous field medical system that we particularly focus on within the theatre of operations. Um, and then principally, um, the, the, the first one is um, medical evacuation, looking at ground capabilities and preferably um, air capabilities as well. And, that, and, and the other aspect is their ability to provide pre-hospital emergency care and having a tiered system that enables them to treat um, their own casualties from a, uh, an indigenous military perspective. There's also the opportunity for, if there is an indigenous military healthcare capability, for them to provide support to the civilian population as well. And it's something that should be considered early, rather than um, the, uh, the, the military, um, international military community actually providing that support. 
Okay, and in terms of the, uh, the indigenous military uh, medical capability, they need to be clearly supporting the wider operational plan within that theatre of operation. So their military commanders, the military medical commanders, need to understand what the operational plan is, is within that theatre of operations so they can plan medical support not only to their own personnel but civilians if that's required. Okay, as I mentioned before, in terms of tactical level issues, development of the indigenous pre-hospital care and, and medevac um, systems, education levels of indigenous personnel. When you're trying to develop an um, indigenous healthcare system, whether civilian or military, clearly um, education levels um, can be an issue. For example, in Afghanistan, when we were trying to develop the um, indigenous um, military medical system, a lot of the um, people who we were, were trying to train couldn't actually read or write. That creates clearly a problem up front in terms of how you're actually going to communicate and how you're actually going to train people to deliver, uh, to, to deliver uh, medical support. And in that particular example, we use more of a um, practical based um, approach than clearly uh, an academic one in terms of the, of the required left reading and writing. Appropriate levels of training. There is the question in terms of what level of healthcare should be provided within a particular theatre of operations. Do we want to impose Western standards of healthcare into a, uh, a theatre of operations in, in, into a country and that um, could be not sustainable in the future or could have an adverse effect within that particular, within the particular country? It's clearly something we've got to, to consider. And what, quite of, what, what happens quite often is that a various number of different international military countries will go in there and, and we'll all be training the indigenous security forces to different syllabuses. One initiative that we're looking at to try and, and develop at the moment is engaging with the International Committee of the Red Cross, who are looking at developing a common first aid syllabus that can be rolled out across the international military medical community to teach to indigenous security forces if, um, if, if we need to. I mean, it's a, it's a problem. Okay, I'm back on track. Um, the end state for the development of the civilian health sector is for an indigenous civilian healthcare worker to provide culturally and clinically appropriate healthcare for an indigenous civilian. Indigenous civilian. The indigenous health civilian healthcare sector has primary responsibility for meeting the healthcare needs of the local population. The relationship between international military forces and an indigenous civilian health sector will be dependent on the military mandate ranging from exclusively civilian military relationship in a humanitarian assistance operation to a minimal relationship during war fighting, limited only to fulfilling international obligations under the Geneva Convention. Where possible, the role of the international military medical community should be to do nothing. This is likely to, uh, there is likely to be a limit to the number of indigenous civilian edu educated personnel who are competent to manage development projects. There is also a finite limit to the number of interpreters who can both facilitate international engagements. This, compounded with a threat by, insur by the insurgents, also make it challenging to recruit healthcare workers. At first glance, military medical units uh, may think the solution is to provide uh, direct non-emergency care, often providing as medcaps or medical civil action pro uh, programs, which were actually developed by the Americans during the Vietnam War. Um, how, however, actually providing care in this particular way can do more harm than good to the local um, health, uh, local health sector. Uh, so, for example, if you're going into local villages and you're providing health care, there may be a local person within that particular uh, village who's provide, been providing health care to that uh, village for a, a significant period of time. If you start going into that village, delivering a, uh, a primary health care clinic, then clearly you're putting that uh, person potentially out of work in terms of their livelihood and you're unbalancing the system uh, within that uh, particular village. There is very clear evidence of the effectiveness of military mobile health clinics. In, there isn't, sorry, there is very clear evidence of the, of the ineffectiveness of military medical health clinics in anything uh, but the short term. Alternatively, constructing or refurbishing healthcare facilities or schools is often selected as a series of military development projects However, again, that can be quite problematic because certainly in the early days in Afghanistan, they were developing facilities like a, uh, a, a maternity hospital, but they didn't actually have the people to employ in the hospital and they didn't have the kit and equipment to actually put in the hospital itself. 
So, you know, the, these are the sorts of short-termism views that we quite often see, not just by the military, but also by the international community um, in other areas in terms of NGOs and international organisations. Okay, the military role of improving access to health services should be considered within, within the wider military approach of stabilisation of shape, secure, whole, develop. This slide illustrates the spectrum of relationships between security forces and health providers according to the security environment. This illustrates the goal of local care, of local care for local people using local civilian medical services. However, this should always be considered to be a short-term solution to meeting an urgent health care need, and there should be a plan to move the relationships to the right of the slide. Conceptually, security operations comprises of several phases. This includes shaping the, the environment to build both relationships with the indigenous population, and also to define and then reduce opposition forces. To secure, to the secure phase is the surge of tactical operations to physically remove uh, opposition forces from the area. Hold is the transition from military operations to police-led security operations to make sure the population is protected from opposition forces. This includes re-establishing or establishing indigenous, government, indigenous governments and the develop is the, the execution phase of reconstruction and development to demonstrate to the population the benefits of supporting the instruments of government and gaining their consent. This should include transferring governance and security from international security forces to indigenous political actors and their own security forces. Ideally, plans should be backwards, i.e. from the right of the slide, the agreement between stakeholders on what transition looks like and the resources required to achieve the entire process. This may be consolidated into a stabilization plan. It's important to establish performance metrics for health sector development at the beginning of operations. This will routinely be the responsibility of civilian agencies, um, though security forces may support data collection. This is likely to be uh, based on a combination of measures of activity and measures of effect. This data is likely to be found from a wide range, range of sources, including the Ministry of Public Health, World Health Organization, um, and other sources as well. This slide shows examples of how health sector development performance indicators can be used on operations. In summary then, the final slide. Engagement with indigenous health sectors in crisis is an inevitable component um, of military operations. The defence medical services are mandated to be competent in the field, which typically includes three components. Emergency care to the indigenous population, security sector reform, and development of the indigenous health sector. Each of these tasks brings unique ethical challenges. This presentation is provided an overview of the military medical contribution to security and stabilization. Those people that would like to add further details on joint, on joint doctrine notes 3 and dash 4 can find it um, on, the, um, on the two links there. The first one is the defense internet, which is a military system, and the second one um, is the uh, is the World Wide Web. That concludes my presentation. I think we've got a bit of time and it would be good to have a bit of a discussion if there are any questions on some, everything, part uh, of what I've just discussed. <laughs>